With world events seemingly out of control, I've asked my national security guru and frequent guest, Stephen Bryan, back for an overview of what's happening and what could happen next. We're in a mess. We're not controlling events. Events are controlling us. And we're doing some things which are reckless. How can you defend Taiwan if it's a non-person? You can't. China wants to take over Taiwan. And we, if we're going to help the Taiwanese resist that, we have to somehow put them into an alliance arrangement where we can do it. We're not doing that. In Asia, we're weak. I think there's no doubt about that. The Chinese have been building up and building up. And we have failed really to set up any kind of defensive scheme or alliance that works. It, it looks like Russia is on the verge of, uh, of a victory, but uh, you're not reading about that much in the mainstream media in the United States. The Russians are now starting to advance slowly, very slowly, conservatively. And the question is, what, they're, what are they trying to advance to? Why is Ukraine so interesting to the United States? What are we trying to achieve? It seems like what we're trying to achieve is to put NATO in Ukraine and push closer to Moscow. And I think it's reckless because it's a red line for the Russians. Haven't we learned that we've been fighting wars against insurgents, guys with bandanas on their head and AK-47s and guerrilla warfare, but we've never really, we haven't fought a conventional type war until Ukraine and Russia went at it. And haven't we learned a lot of our equipment didn't fare all that well in the battlefield? The attitude in the Pentagon was we had superior capabilities to anything the Russians could put in the field. And that by using those superior capabilities that we could stop the Russians. Actually, it didn't work. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Russia's seeming conquest of Ukraine, Zelensky's refusing to negotiate, Hamas slaughtering Israeli citizens, anti-Semitism erupting on campuses in America, China's attempt at displacing the United States in the Middle East and its looming attentions in Taiwan. With world events seemingly out of control, I've asked my national security guru and frequent guest, Stephen Bryan, back for an overview of what's happening and what could happen next. Uh, Stephen is senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy and the Yorktown Institute and has over 50 years experience in the arms trade and national security, including several stints in the Pentagon. Stephen, I'm worried. I'm worried that the United States' long history of mismanaging our national security interests has squandered our ability to control or at least influence events around the world. Thoughts? Lots of thoughts. I mean, this is a, this is a tough one, you know. I mean, uh, can we influence? Yeah, we can to some extent. We're a nuclear power. We have a strong air force, a less strong army, and a less strong navy, except for submarines, where I think we're still strong. But uh, we're being challenged by Russia. We're being challenged by China. We're being challenged by countries like Iran, and we're letting them get away with it. So we've, we've, we're kind of in a mess. We're not controlling events. Events are controlling us. And we're doing some things which are reckless. For example, we're emptying our, emptying our arsenal to support Ukraine, leaving NATO exposed, very exposed, if the Russians really chose to be troublesome in Europe. A very dangerous thing to do. Uh, in Asia, we're weak. I think there's no doubt about that. The Chinese have been building up and building up and building up. And we have failed really to set up any kind of defensive scheme or alliance that works that can give us any hope of, of putting pressure back on China. The only real hope for the future of China is that internally it can't compete. You know, it's got troubles, economic problems, political problems, clashes of interests in the country. Uh, so maybe it'll implode. But if it doesn't, we're in for a hard time. Well, so you I think. I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I think that it's it's a, a situation where we're not well prepared to deal with these contingencies which are growing in, in importance. We don't have the equivalent of NATO in the Pacific. You mentioned no. our inability to put together strategic alliances. I mean, that seems to be a blunder at, at best. Well, I mean, also that they don't. The, the, you know, the, the 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 players who are impacted either don't ask for an alliance or a strong alliance anyway, 
or in one case, Taiwan is simply left out of the equation. So Taiwan is like a non-person. Well, how can you defend Taiwan if it's a non-person? You can't. I mean, at the end of the day, you got to decide what you want to do about Taiwan. You can't keep this mythology, well, one China, they have to negotiate some result, and then they never do, of course. China wants to take over Taiwan. That's clear. And we, if we're going to help the Taiwanese resist that, we have to somehow put them into an alliance arrangement where we can do it. We're not doing that. So shifting back to NATO and what's happening with Ukraine and Russia, uh, you and I've talked, oh gosh, many times about what, what's happening there. What, what's the, it, it looks like Russia's on the verge of, uh, of a victory, uh, but uh, you're not reading about that much uh, in the mainstream media in the United States. What, what's your take on what's happening there? Well, I mean, in the war itself, let's talk war first, you know, the actual battlefield. Uh, the Russians are now starting to advance slowly, very slowly, conservatively. And the question is, what, they're, what are they trying to advance to? <laughs> you know, where are they going? Um, on one, you know, at least at the moment, it looks like they're trying to straighten the line to cover Luhansk and, and Donetsk areas so that they can actually protect those areas in the future. And that's, that's why the, that's, that. that's the eastern portion of the country. That's the eastern portion yeah. from the north to the south. Yeah. Um, and so they're concentrating, particularly the big battle right now is Avdivka, where the Russians are really pushing hard to try and push the Ukrainians out. It's like a salient that sticks its nose right almost to the capital of Donetsk itself. So it's it's a very important piece of territory for the Russians. And I think they'll take it but it may take some weeks. So on the battlefield, the Russians are making gains. Uh, meanwhile, we're running out of ammunition. We just don't have it. Our European friends don't have it either. We scraped up what stuff we had in Israel, unfortunately bad timing, and scraped up what we had in Korea, again bad timing, to send to Ukraine. Why is Ukraine so interesting to the United States? What are we trying to achieve there? I mean, it, it seems like what we're trying to achieve is to put NATO in Ukraine and, and push closer to Moscow, which is essentially what successive administrations have been doing. And I think it's reckless because it's a red line for the Russians. It wouldn't have been in a Russian invasion if we hadn't tried to do that. Uh, so now we're faced with, a, with some bad choices. And I think it's going to get worse because at some point, naked the naked underbelly of NATO is going to be visible. And, and, and that's not good because it could crack the alliance. It's not happened yet, but it could happen. Uh, and well, I think that's coming. Didn't, didn't we, I mean, you were a weapons expert. You were, were you head of procurement at the Pentagon or some job? No, no, I did technology security. Okay. So uh, you, you say we've, we've scraped the shelves bare in Korea and, in Taiwan to help support, or Israel rather, to help support uh, Ukraine. What do we mean by the arms? Is it, are they, are we talking ammunition? Are we talking tanks? Are we talking, uh, you know, what kinds of equipment uh, are we without now that we had before? Well, I mean, the big losses have been in precision equipment, you know, things like uh, anti-tank missiles, ground to air missiles, that sort of thing. We've run out of those. Even Patriot missiles were you know, we just redeployed a bunch of patriots to the Middle East because of the crisis there. But I'll tell you a little secret. We don't have any missiles. So, you know, after a while, I mean, we can do the initial. But if it got heavy, we'd have a problem. Uh, the Saudis had to beg and borrow and steal to get some extra missiles because they get hit all the time by the Houthis. Uh, so we, we have scraped the bottom of the barrel on, on the patriot. We've run out of any tanks. We've, we've run out of artillery, 155, 155 millimeter standard ammunition, nothing special, which is used in the tens of thousands of rounds in, in Ukraine. Uh, we're out of it. We're trying who to make it now. Who manufactures that? Who, who makes that? Is that here in the United States? Which, yeah, it's uh, made in, in uh, I think, four arsenals in the United States and two private companies. Well, without, being the, the without, without the, at the risk of being, being even gloomier, uh, haven't we learned that we've been fighting 
wars against insurgents, you know, guys with bandanas on their head and AK-47s and guerrilla warfare. But we've never really, we haven't fought a conventional type war uh, until Ukraine and Russia went at it. And haven't we learned a lot of our equipment didn't fare all that well in the battlefield? Well, some of it worked for a while, but like any other battlefield, you know, the enemy figures out how to counter it. So like take the HIMARS, which is a very good system, I think, very effective, but limited in quantity. Again, there's not enough of them. But the Russians now have learned to shoot them down. So, you know, you have to move on to the next thing. So the problem with war today is if you're going to have a conventional war that takes a long time, and I think Ukraine is now taking a long time, uh, you're going to run out of stuff. You're going to run out of stuff and stuff that you have is not going to perform up to snuff. Take the the German Leopard tank. The Leopard tank was considered the best tank in the world, better than the U.S. Abrams. It's so good that you didn't have to put applique armor on it because it was so capable of self-defense. Well, they've been destroyed. A lot of them have been destroyed in Ukraine already by the Russians. Applique yeah. armor is what? It's applique a, is, a, is a level of reactive armor that you put on the okay. outside of the tank to try and deflect an incoming round. By, by breaking its force. Uh, it's sort of like he, uh, ever, for every reaction, there's a reaction. So if you have a reaction against an incoming, you push it away and it loses its velocity. But uh, they, they never put it on the, on the Leopards because the, the Germans said you don't need it. It's, we have such great armor and internally that nothing can penetrate it. Well, guess what? <laughs> something did. More than well, something. A well, lot of things did. It, 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 let me infer, I, I, what I'm hearing is that you really can't fight a real conventional war unless you gear up to do it properly. And you can't do it with one arm tied behind your back. You can't do it casually. I mean, the United States uh, national defense and, and, and foreign policy establishment seems to assume our hegemony and omnipotence and our ability to do things almost, you know, if we at a whim, we can we can take over this country, remove this dictator, et cetera, et cetera. Right. As I mentioned at the outset, our, our ability to do that um, is vanishingly small anymore, even even if we never were very good at regime change. But now I think we're even worse at it than ever. <laughs> well, maybe you shouldn't try. Um, well, that would be <laughs> I'm in that camp. <laughs> Um, I, th I think overall the attitude, in, here. <laughs> the attitude in the Pentagon was we had superior capabilities to anything the Russians could put in the field. And that by using those superior capabilities, network systems, high tech, lots of uh, sophisticated communications, satellites, drones, the whole package that we could stop the Russians actually didn't work. And, and the great proof was this big offensive that the Ukrainians launched back in June, which now is over, the fight to the south in Zafaritsa and over by Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the idea was that we would overrun the what are called the Surovikin defenses that the Russians put there, and that we would then break the connection of the south of Ukraine to Crimea, and then isolate Crimea, and then the Ukrainians could go on and launch a war against Crimea. And meanwhile, we would bomb the Kerch Strait Bridge that connects Russia to Crimea and knock that out so that the Russians couldn't use it to resupply. That was the plan. This was run through all kinds of simulations. Uh, NATO trained our the Ukrainian troops. A lot of NATO people were in the field supporting them. Uh, everything you can imagine we threw into that pot. And guess what? It failed not only failed, but it was extraordinarily costly to the Ukrainians. They lost thousands of dead, 25,000 or more were killed. Lots of equipment destroyed. And how much did they gain? They gained nothing. They didn't break the Sorovikin defenses. I'm beginning to think we're, we've got something I'm going to become calling governments by simulation. And the, the, yeah. military, the Defense Department simulation sounds... Well, if the simulation effective. shows that it, it must be right. As, yeah. as Well, it's the same simulation model as the climate change people use. And also the Federal Reserve has got some policy, got some models that uh, 
have been equally good at predicting. Uh, you know the old saying, garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, well, it's uh, so. If you put in a bunch of assumptions about the performance of a weapon system and it doesn't yeah. meet those performance standards, then the whole simulation is, is junk, waste of time. Well, now we're brought up short by reality. And Zelensky, who has been, has loved his role in the world stage, and his wife shopping in Paris, uh, refuses well, to negotiate. Well, he has a lot of extra cash. <laughs> well, he does. <laughs> I want to ask you where the money went, but my first question is... It's not my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> the, the shopping in Paris, or the, where the money went. Well, I'll do that. If you give me some money, I'll... <laughs> I'll be, I'll be very happy to go do it. <laughs> now, the, the word is, and you've written about this, is that uh, uh, our, our, our geniuses in the State Department now think it'd be a good idea if Zelensky went. Um, Victoria Nuland overthrew the, what the Ukraine government in 2014, and now she right. let do it again. Um, Zelensky doesn't want to go, and Zelensky doesn't want to negotiate. So where does that leave us? It's a thing called a rock in a hard place, you know. <laughs> uh, we're, we are in a mess because, first of all, uh, Zelensky is the, is the symbol of the Ukrainian resistance, let's say that. And if he goes, what next? Uh, there's no democracy in, you know, put away all the propaganda. There's no democracy in Ukraine. It's run 100% by Zelensky. He controls the media. He's a media guy. Uh, he controls the propaganda. Uh, he puts his uh, opponents in jail or worse. If they're outside of the country, he has them assassinated. I mean, it's a tough bunch. Uh, now he's in a fight with his military commanders. That's the thing to know. Zelushny, who's the commander overall of the armed forces, Sierski, who's the armed ground forces commander, are at odds with Zelensky on the war. They realize that they're in difficulty, that they're losing too many troops, that the end game is bad. They want to pull back, kind of uh, build a defensive perimeter very much closer to the heartland of the country, Kiev, in that area, and then make a deal with the Russians. I think that's their, their, what they prefer. Uh, Zelensky does not prefer that. So the fighting in Bakhmut again, and the fighting in uh, of Dika, uh, is all Zelensky. He wants those places taken. He's trying to push the Russians out. They don't think they can push the Russians out. They think they're getting their, they're losing. Well, would so, his next move be to try to pull NATO in? Zelensky might try to do something to get pull somebody involved with, and and and, and spark a wider war war to take pressure off of him. Well, there's been that uh, that claim. I don't put much credence okay. in. Uh, even the Poles who don't like the Russians, not at all, <laughs> for good reason. Um, they they don't want to get into war. They, so they where understand. We, the where do we, we've we've seemed to have gotten to a place where we don't have that many options. What do you? I want to. I do want to talk about Israel, Hamas, and that no. that, that catastrophe in a, in a moment. But let's. Let's, let's, let's finish up. Well, I mean, the problem we have now is that we need to talk to the Russians. Today, uh, I don't know when you'll broadcast this, but today is the 13th of November. Uh, Schultz in Germany said, well, I'd like to talk to the Russians. I want to talk to Putin. Now, he had nothing to say, <laughs> but he wants to talk to Putin. I mean, it's a, you're starting to see... Uh, the Danish foreign minister said, yeah, we've been talking under the table. I mean, there, there's there's movement. It's not a lot yet, but there's movement. And I think that that's where we have to go. Wouldn't but it, Putin the, Russians think, the Russians think the only way to make a deal is with Washington. Well, the Putin thing seems to be all tied up in domestic politics, going back to the 2016 election and the loathing of the people in the Biden administration of all things, Trump and Trump was supposedly Putin's captive or captive. Yeah. Trump, you know, vice versa. I don't know who was uh, in each other's arms, but because of their loathing of, of Putin, um, they refused to, 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 to talk with Russia. I mean, at what point do they have to? Uh, well, they tried up? to kill him multiple yeah. times. Yeah. 
I mean, let's be honest about it, including Prigozhin. I think Prigozhin was was a creature, uh, became a creature of the West and made deals with Western intelligence through Budanov, who was the Ukrainian chief. Now, of, but he was the Wagner group? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, he was. He's the one that got killed outside of Moscow and when his plane mysteriously blew up. Um, one of those bad days, you know. Yeah. But uh, but I think that the whole Prigozhin mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> but the Prigozhin operation, it seems to me, was a Western intelligence operation. Yeah. To, to try and get regime. They're, they're desperate for regime change in, in, in Russia, which is madness in a way, because Prigozhin's an outlier. But the typical potential replacements that we know about, if someday. If, if, if Putin stepped down or he got sick or something happened, they're not going to be any better than Putin. I mean, it may be worse because they're not as smart. Well, the thing that I said at the outset is that we've squandered our ability to influence events. It, it seems like what's happened, and you and I talked about this a year and a half ago, you know, month after month, we, we've, we've continued to pursue aims which we were not able to achieve and so we've emptied our shelves of, uh, of weaponry and ammunition, which has made us much more vulnerable in the Middle East. And I know you've read everywhere, written, everywhere, uh, everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. And China, yeah. Taiwan. Uh, and so let, let, let's talk about you take three aircraft carriers and send them to the Middle East. What do you got left in Asia? What do you have left in Europe? Well, and China already has almost as many naval ships in that area as we do. So Not anymore. Not anymore? No, they have more. Oh, they have more now. Okay, yeah. well, see, that's why. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure they're as good, but they have more. But they've got more. Okay, so let's let's shift. Our, okay, so we've got a, an issue we have not figured out a resolution for in, in Ukraine. Let's shift to what, what do you think, how do you see things happening in, in, um, in the Gaza Strip and Israel and Iran and Saudi Arabia, oh my gosh, the whole crew. And now we've got China in their uh, negotiating I deal. Wouldn't, I wouldn't count China as very much of a player there. Okay. Uh, at least not yet. They, they don't have enough of a blue water Navy to really insert themselves in any way. They have no bases near and well, they have one on the Red Sea, but but not really. We're, we're right next to them. So if they tried anything, we'd squash them. No, I, I think the, the situation is, is that the Israelis have set their minds to cleaning out Hamas and getting rid of it uh, and, and making it a non-factor in terms of threats to Israel. That's, that's what they're after. Um, they're, they've got a pretty interesting strategy to bring this about, which is cutting Gaza in half. So there's the northern part, the southern part, and they've split them. And now they're working on Gaza City, which is the stronghold of the main stronghold of Hamas. Not the only one, but the main one. And of course, the, everyone's got their eyes on Al Shifa Hospital, which is underneath there is where the Hamas headquarters are. And we'll see what happens. But you know, the Hamas has no hesitation to use human shields uh, yeah. to operate out of schools and mosques and hospitals. Well, they build the ambulances for military to haul missiles around. I mean, they're 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 very difficult. I mean, that's what they do. They they don't follow what we would normally think of the rules of war. The rules of war for them is you either win or lose. So they're gonna they want to win. So they do anything. It's a horrible crimes that they do. Horrible crimes. Well, this this administration seems to be fond of regime change now. Their idea of regime change is getting rid of Netanyahu. Because he's been <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're still at it. And Hillary has joined the course. Yeah. Uh, it's madness. First of all, there won't be any change in the government in Israel until after the war, for sure. Then there will be an inquiry. There has to be uh, as to how come this happened. Because the policy that that Yahoo was follow, following is exactly until the, this disaster is exactly the same policy that every Israeli prime minister has followed going all the way back to, I don't know when, Rabin, maybe. I mean, it, it's they, they, they thought that they call it mowing the grass. 
the idea was if these guys become too threatening, go and mow the grass, knock them off, push them back, and and carry on. That's Iron Dome, and it's a brilliant system, brilliant system. But Iron Dome alleviated for them the problem the prob problem of having to deal with Hamas, because when they shot off all these missiles, Iron Dome would shoot them down. So everyone said, "That's great. No, let's go back to work. Uh, not worry about it." Uh, and I think that overconfidence that, that Iron Dome could save them didn't help when the terrorists came across the border and came in by sea, came in even by gliders and, 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 and raped and killed and murdered innocent people, thousands of them, 2,000, something like that. That's an yeah. awful thing. Uh, and wounded another few thousand. So it, it, it was a crime, but it was also a wake-up call to the Israelis that this policy, this policy that they long followed, and supplemented with Iron Dome and things like that, wasn't good enough, didn't work. Now, the inquiry is going to try to find why the intelligence failed and and why the, the, they, were, they were able to pull this off. Because it, the, when they pulled it off, most of the reserve forces weren't there in the South. And, and the regular forces were mostly on leave. There was no, almost nobody covering the South when this happened. Yet there was a lot of intelligence that said these guys are planning and getting ready to do something big like this. And basically, they discounted it. And I think that's where the inquiry will be. Now, probably after that, Netanyahu will probably have to resign. I don't think there's any doubt about it. There will be some form of a new government. Uh, my so he'll, government he'll, 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 he'll take the blame for the intelligence failure? He'll have to. Yeah. Same as Golda ended up, reluctantly <clears throat> as hell, taking the blame for the Yom Kippur War. Uh, you know, so she, what, what should the United States be doing now except for calling for strategic pauses or whatever euphemism we've, we've, uh, we've trotted out uh, at, at press conferences? What, what should we be doing? Well, the United States has a legitimate interest in, in, in getting the hostages out because a lot of them are Americans. So... You know, that's a legitimate interest. The United States has legitimate inter in interest in Israel uh, being strong and secure. That's part of our interest. Uh, the United States has an interest in keeping its relations with the other Arab countries, Saudi Arabia most importantly, but others too, Jordan being on the rocks at the moment. Uh, and the United States has an interest which is not fulfilling, which is to deal with Iran. Because at the... the the long hand of Iran is behind all this, and, well, the, and everyone knows it. The the Iran is a is a mystery because talk about re, people hating their own regime. I mean, the regime in Iran is loathed by most of the people in the country, and and uh, the people here, some of the some of the State Department types have shipped tens of billions of dollars to Iran. The six there's a six billion everybody talks about, but there's. 20, 30, 40 billion dollars over the last uh, period of time that's gone in Iran's uh, yeah. direction. Crazy. And yet that, that has not seemed to buy us any influence there whatsoever. Because that's not their, their equation is different than ours. They think in terms of how they can destroy Israel, <clears throat> how they can take over that whole crescent of territory from Iraq, you know, Lebanon, Syria, Israel. Well, well, what do we think we're buying when we send money to Iran? I don't, I don't understand. Well, you got to go ask what? Biden. Well, he thinks he was buying. I mean, they, they had. Con I, I think the, our government's infiltrated. To be honest with you, and I think there's increasing evidence that our government's infiltrated, and its policy decisions affecting Iran are are twisted, really twisted. So we're not following our national interest. Our we're national about interest is not to allow Iran to conquer. And uh, nearby countries, and to destabilize the Middle East because it's not in our interest, it's not in Europe's interest, it's not in the world's interest. Well, you, you look at our relationship with China, and we talk, and and the notion of elite capture comes up, and Joe Bright, Biden as a controlled asset because of all his dealings with China, and they really have his number when it comes to bank records and emails and uh, de check deposits and that sort of thing. They could take him out in a heartbeat. I hadn't thought that there was influence from 
Iran or other Middle Eastern countries in the State Department. I know there's been the, the, uh, the, the there was some term for the people in the State Department who love the Arabs. I can't remember what it was, but is you, you believe we've been in well? We know there. that there are people in the State Department and in the Pentagon, and in the White House, who are pro-Iranian, very strongly pro-Iranian. Some of them are people with with Iranian names. So we have Iranian yeah, with security clearances in, all in our government. We have Palestinian partisans in our government. Yep. We have Chinese partisans in our government. Yeah, they call them bear huggers. Bear huggers. So, as I said, I you know it's, <laughs> I, I, I you know you've been called the Yoda of the arms trade. I'm I'm looking, I'm calling you my national security guru. So so. <laughs> Where does this leave us? Where do we where do we well, go? It needs to be cleaned up. But anyway, well, it's not going to be cleaned up in this administration. You know that. This administration isn't going to do anything. So for 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 us to get control of our national security, we need a new administration. Period. And we need an administration. Uh, I think so, yes. Okay. We need people that have clear head and understand that they have, you know, there's some malevolent actors in the government and outside of the government. That need to be dealt with. Okay. I want to go over time here. We were originally going to do 30 minutes, but I want to talk with you about China and the Chinese Communist Party and what's happening there and how you, I mean, you've been in the view that, that they're in trouble, they're on the ropes, and that, um, you know, that's a bullish sign for us. And yet, when I look at events today, they don't, you know, regardless of all the problems they've got, they seem to be acting just as aggressively if not more so than ever. Well, Biden wants to bail him out, economically at least, and he's going to meet with Xi soon, in, and uh, we'll see what comes out of that. But it'll probably be... He's meeting this week, yeah. yeah. Yeah, more money for China. I mean, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Uh, internally, China has a whole bunch of problems, uh, economic ones, the, the banking system is a mess, the healthcare system doesn't exist. It's virtually dead. Uh, most people can't get healthcare in China. Mm. Uh, there are no pensions. You know, you just you're on your own. So there's a lot of unemployment, growing num amount of unemployment, and a lot of companies, you know, are being threatened by this made in China approach that Xi is taking. So, so they're they're moving some of their capabilities like Foxconn outside of China as quickly as they can and get away with it. The Foxconn employs a million people, more than a million people. Well, the, the foreign direct investment in China dropped to negative numbers for the first time since 1998, yeah. which is, I think, when we started tracking. And that's, but that's always looking ahead. And I'm looking back and okay. I'm saying, who's there now? Mm -hmm. And are they going to stay? Are they going to reduce their profile? Because, you know, if you're a Western executive, you can't go to China right now. You might get arrested. Well, so, I've so that's one dimension of the problem. It's not the only one. The, the other no, problem is that there's a there's a fight going on inside the Chinese Communist Party. Between factions, there are at least three known factions. And, and, and the latest, the death of the, uh, the former Chinese uh, premier who uh, mysteriously had a heart attack. Uh, how old was he, 64 or something like that? Uh, people don't believe that in China. They think they, they poisoned him somehow. Uh, there's a lot of strain going on, and Xi is trying to consolidate his power, not only with these factions, but also with the, with the military, because he's he's been ripping apart the military, especially the rocket forces, and firing their leaders. So... We don't know enough to be able to say how much of a threat it really is to Xi, but it must be enough for him to want to take fairly draconian measures of getting rid of officials, getting rid of military guys, uh, maybe assassinations, who knows, uh, to to make this, uh, to solidify his position. And that's what dictators do. Well, instead, we've got Biden going to have this meeting with Xi. Um, I understand the great, they're going. Xi, the great humanitarian. Yeah, I, I'm going to. I, th I understand they're going to meet alone. I will have translators, obviously, but 
Biden one on one with Xi is a very scary thought. And he's going with tough demands like, well, we'd like we'd like to talk with you more and we'd like you to be more open and we'd like you to uh, um, care about the climate more. And we, you know, we'd like you. And so all the things like fentanyl and uh, and human rights abuses and uh, yeah. massive, massive trade uh, um, crimes uh, are going to go unmentioned. So well, my theory is that the, the script is already written. In other words, this the, the, the fact that Biden's going to sit there with Xi and have his little three by five cards means nothing. He could say he could he could speak in, in any language he chooses. The deal's made. The deal's made. And they will come out with a 14 point or 18 point, 20 point, whatever is going to be summary of their conclusions, which have already been made. It'd be nice if we knew what they were, but that's it will all be fluff, I think, because it, it will hide the fact that what uh, we're trying to do, at least economically, is to be helpful to China. Uh, and uh, I don't know how we can do that. We're broke. <laughs> we haven't got any yeah, money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know where we're going to find any cash to give the Chinese. I don't know why we'd want to give any. But I think this is already cooked, cooked deal. So, you know, Xi wouldn't meet with Biden unless they had a cooked deal. He's not going to take a chance on a negative meeting. And nor is Biden. So I think it's already done. Well, this meeting, this meeting burnishes G power, G's power in China. Exactly. So that's why it's a mistake. Yeah. It, I don't think it's a good time to do that because, you know, it's not clear where things are going. Well, I don't like, I, I don't like to think, I don't want, I don't like to think of a line of action as having just to hang on until the next election, but it looks like that's what, that's what I'm hearing. Well, I don't, I don't see much hope right now for any major policy shifts. Yeah. Um, not from the US, maybe from the Europeans who are getting very antsy. Um, the Russians know, China mm -hmm. know. So we're going to see more of the same. And as I said, as far as Iran is concerned, it leaves them in the catbird seat when they shouldn't be. I mean, we should be putting real pressure on China. Now, some will say, well, we are, we've sent our fleet to the Eastern Med, but that's not the Persian Gulf. Um, we've sent our fleet in there, so we're putting pressure on and we're bombing things in Iraq when these, or Syria when these crazy people bomb our bases. The problem is, you know, when the Houthis launching ballistic missiles at Israel, there's two now, and cruise missiles, I don't know how many, but probably six or eight, uh, that's Iranian. So Iran is making war on our uh, client, our country, uh, our, not our country, our ally. Um, they're making war on our ally, and we're saying nothing. There's not been a single complaint from the White House or from the State Department or from the Pentagon about what the Houthis are doing and what Iranians are doing helping the Houthis do it. Not a word. Now, that's not diffusing the crisis. That's deepening the crisis. So I think that something <clears throat> needs to change. That can be changed relatively quickly without great difficulty. And it would send a good, strong message to the Chinese and to the Russians and anybody else. If you mess with us, we'll mess with you. That's all. Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> Stephen, I, we've got to wrap up. I... Uh, I I, 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 I wish I could I, make you happier, but I don't you think never, I can. You, you almost never do. <laughs> <laughs> I ask myself, I really want to. I really want to learn about what's really going on. Well, I do, even if even if the the, the moment. Yeah, is sometimes it's better good. just to watch football. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, thanks again, Dr. Stephen Bryan, who's uh, at the Center for Security Policy and. Uh, 50 years experience in the national security and, and uh, national defense business. And as always filled with wisdom and um, ne next time we're going to come back with uh, rays of hope, I, I hope, and uh, we'll follow events and uh, we'll talk, I'm sure we'll be talking in the next few months. So Stephen, thanks again. And uh, we'll thanks talk for having soon. me.
Yeah, great. Thank you. Bill. So this has been the Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, um, if you're watching this, please subscribe. The su subscribe button. Ask your friends to do the same. Um, as you know, we're on all the major podcast platforms and Rumble and YouTube and on Substack and also on CPAC now on Monday nights. So there's lots of places you can catch the show and send us your comments about uh, 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 topics you'd like to see us cover and we'll, uh, we'll get right at it. So good talking with you. Thanks.